Now what will it be? Death or exile? Tonight, myself, Chris, and Lupe are back, and we will discuss Netflix hot series, Stranger Things, and HBO's greatest television show of all time, as far as they're concerned, uh, Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lupe, Chris, how you guys doing? I'm all right. I'm chilling. I'm ready for this. Uh, it's your boy, Lupe. Live, love, Lupe on Twitter. Uh, I, I do have a few things to say about Stranger Things. Not the kindest things to say about <laughs> Stranger Things, but I actually have great things to say about Game of Thrones. So it seems like I'm running counterculture on this one, and it's all good. I'm an I exile. Mean, that's, that's the whole point of, the, of why we do what we do. So, you know, it's just, I'm sure that, you know, some people will, will appreciate a different viewpoint. Chris, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about these shows as well. Been big fan of both so um let's see how uh, the final the latest seasons of both of the uh, shaped up in my mind i agree i agree I, i'm a big fan of both and i'm gonna we're warning the audience right now before we dive in that uh it's going to be uh fully spoilered so um if you haven't seen these shows yet you know what to do <laughs> they are on streaming so you really don't have an excuse so um uh let's uh, start off with uh, stranger things um why don't you, uh, Lupe, why don't you get us started on your thoughts on the previous seasons uh, and how you think that season three fits into into that, into it? All right. So uh, with Stranger Things, I can honestly say that the only reason why I've watched Stranger Things are two reasons. One, I watch a lot of, you know, series. And also, I watched it just to be up on the conversation, just to stay culturally, you know, knowledgeable and culturally relevant. I don't think it's as good as a lot of people give it credit for. That's my opinion. There are a lot more you know, better shows out there that Homecoming. I personally prefer. Homecoming! <laughs> <laughs> Homecoming. Maybe we're going to talk about Game of Thrones. I think Game of Thrones is a better, is a better series. So I, I think Stranger Things is overrated. A crucify me that's the same way jesus died <laughs> it's all good um but season one i thought was okay i thought that it leaned too much into nostalgia and and creating a show um in the same way and using the same tropes as a lot of 80s you know tv uh a lot of 80s films did i felt that that was a crutch i felt that it didn't have a lot more going for it i do I think agree. it's i do think it's well made it is well made it's one of the better looking um series on netflix in terms of like image quality and like composition that sort of thing um but it was just to me just full of like 80s tropes and 80s like nostalgia i actually prefer season two because season two went deeper into the mythology. Season two got some of the characters out of their comfort zones and explored them a lot more. Um, I thought that season two was a good escalation. Um, and now we have season three. I feel like season three, in a strange way, took a departure from the story that was building in season one and two. Because I really want to know a lot more about the uh, the inside, upside down. They also call it the inside out. I think that actually sounds better. <laughs> that's how little that's how little fuck stupid has to give about Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I I thought that season two really set up uh, a whole like mythology and exploration of what was going on there. And I just felt like season three just com I won't say completely abandoned that. But it didn't really have much of that sort of trajectory going on. And then um, more of an exploration of like uh, 11's like powers and powers like, you know, getting like stronger or what was going on with it. I just feel like it just took like this tangent 
that I just wasn't really here for. And I feel like it was it was just a weird season. I didn't like season three. Okay. Uh, Chris, what about you? Okay, so I, I'm a big fan of uh, season one of Stranger Things. Uh, I think one of the one of the difficult things that um, that films and series face when they try and uh, pull from nostalgia periods like the 80s or the 70s or the 90s, especially the the 80s, is a lack of understanding of um, how things actually were. So when you watch uh, Stranger Things, from my perspective, it felt like the Duffer Brothers and the creators of this show created this 80s environment very seamlessly. It didn't feel like, to me anyway, a, uh, a nostalgia piece. It felt like it was... They had a story to tell, and it just so happened to be in the 80s. And all their references and all their um, callbacks to X-Men comics or, you know, certain television adverts, I felt they played a... um, I I felt they were seamless and they played a part in... Uh, rounding out the world in a in a manner that was not on the, on the nose. It wasn't a oh look, this is the eighties. Look at my big hair. It was, um, it was just very seamless. It wasn't. It didn't feel to me like it was uh, on the nose. However, season three felt to me that it was used as a crutch. The typical tropes of, so for example, the the evil Russians that was a typical trope of the eighties. Um, the big villain, uh, Schwarzenegger looking, uh, <laughs> brain dead, moronic villain of the eighties, like he came out of a Die Hard film. Um, it was done in such a careless way um it it just felt to me that it was an attempt to imitate the villains of the 80s rather than recreating a villain from the 80s and that wasn't just with the villains it was with almost everything i felt they had they had suffered from Um, the number of interesting characters they created in the first season and also in the second season that they didn't know what to do with them and it was and the story suffered so they picked out some mundane uh, kind of series of events just to showcase um, all of these characters that people cared about rather than focusing on the three boys and you know the two adults it was oh and then there's this uh, these two people oh and then there's these three people that you remembered from last season oh and then there's the three and the, the four boys from season 1 it, it was just poorly done the relationship between hopper and um will's mom was just atrocious Damn. <laughs> no it, it was not natural in the slightest it was a it was a marvel romance set in the 80s and it just did not fit it was 2018 2019 comedy set in 1980 and i did not like it whatsoever so for me Season three had these positives. I won't, I won't bash on it completely, but the negatives far outweigh it for me, uh, especially as a big, big fan of how how they did season one. Uh, I I appreciate both of your insights on uh, on the series. Uh, I was a big fan of season one. I still think that season one might be up there with some of the best things that Netflix has done. Like you know, I agree. Uh, season two, I enjoy season two more than most people did. I know a lot of people felt season two was a drop off, but I enjoyed it. Uh, season three, I'm just like 
I think we're all on the same page. I do not like season three. Um, all of the things that made season one and season two uh, such a joy to watch all seem to be gone, and instead, exploit we they they focused on exploiting uh, character moments and character interactions, and a lot of them really didn't add up to much. And uh, like you said, there's some good things. There's some there's some interesting ideas. Uh, and and there are some interesting themes that are not explored well, but they're there. And 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 on, honestly, one of the biggest issues I had was um, this. It felt more nostalgic bait than the previous seasons. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, before it did feel like a more natural fit. Uh, and then after watching this season, I kind of asked myself, you know, could couldn't this show be set today? Now, you know, like there's. Like all of the '80s stuff around it, just kind of feel very. Um, it, it just it just feels very, um, very. What's the word I'm looking for? Forced. Think, yes, it feels very forced. It feels very forced. So, um, why don't we um, we talk deeper into it? Uh, Lupe, do you think that the show has improved in any way? The only way, the only thing I thought was like an improvement was I, I think the progression of. 11's assimilation into into regular civilian normal kid life you know her you know getting a relationship learning about boys you know going to the mall with her friends that kind of thing um i i was glad for for someone who's had her childhood so far stolen from her i was glad to see her assimilating you know learning more of these things falling in love you know making mistakes you know being you know a little bit heartbroken um, disappointed all those things i thought that that was good character uh it's not necessarily character development which is a good a good arc for her to go through okay uh chris do you have anything to add to that uh any any ways you yeah. feel the show has improved yeah, I'll echo that. And, and also seeing the expansion of her powers. So she was dealing with um she was dealing with like a massive monster this time and just tearing it apart. Also thought it was pretty cool how um she used her her powers to spy on the boys and that was a kind of part of her growing up as an adolescent girl, you know, with her friend. Um closing the door with her mind and, and things like that. So we see how we see her powers as being assimilated into the regular daily things that uh, an adolescent girl will go through. And um, I thought it was interesting. I, I think some, like I said, some of the things were done really well. I think the sets were, were, were beautiful. Yeah, again. I, was about to, I was about the, to say that they haven't fallen off or they haven't faltered. The mall. The VFX, yeah. the visual effects and special effects remain strong. Yeah, the mall you know. they created, this, a new set for this season was brilliant. Hawkins the is still good. Layer the underground layer was done very well. Um, I, everything, all the technical aspects were, were not a drop-off for me. I think the, the technical parts of the, the series were, were really good. Um, okay. but like I said, my major gripe is... is purely story and character related. Okay, so uh, let's talk about that. Like is there like let's talk about some of the missteps that we all feel that this season fell into. Um uh Chris, you want to get us started? Like tell us uh, are there any like specific story elements that you felt uh brought this season down? Yeah, so with respect to story, the the whole Russian angle again, it was I get it. Like we we live in a political climate today where it kind of feels like a a new a new modern day cold war so it probably was playing on their mind to bring that element into um into this latest season um which is and and we see a lot of uh Rus russo centric soviet centric uh, shows uh Currently, especially with the likes of Chernobyl coming out on, on streaming recently as well. So I think there's, I don't know if there's some kind of uh, playing into the political climate involved. But, um, but it wasn't organically done. And that's the thing that I'll, 
that, that I wanted to go to, it was forced. Like, it, what? It was forced. How, 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 does, it, how, how does a whole army of Russians, Russians appear in the United States in the 1980s build a massive, build a massive facility with nobody knowing about it? Maybe you can build a small base with a small number of people, okay, but none of it was believable. None of it was, you know, none, yeah, of, it was reason- is, that, none of it was even reasonable. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I felt like that the show was always capable of balancing that. Like, like there, there's some crazy things that happen on this show. Let's not deny course, that. But it always kind of felt like it was within this realm of I, I don't want to say realism but you, you you'd be like okay I can I can see that but like I feel like this is believable for their world look, yeah look, exactly this is not even believable for that yeah world. exactly this because was just like yo we're just gonna have the Russians we're gonna have this Russian dude called Alexi and I'm supposed to care for him because he likes Slurpee and he likes America and like it's, it's, it's just oh we're gonna bring back the other dude from the last season who was crazy because he speaks Russian and like I'm like okay okay uh, all right so, yeah. so here's the thing right with season one you had the fantastical element right you had that one fantastical element which was the upside down and the demagogue and, and everything related to that fantastical element. You can believe anything or you can anything within that sphere is in the realms of uh, acceptance and, um, you know, you can suspend your disbelief within that sphere. Everything else in that world was portrayed as normal. Yeah. Everything else. People are just Hawkins. People have the regular intelligence of, of regular <laughs> intelligent human beings. Correct. It's not like it's a spoof and they're like puppets running around and presidents, you know, dancing and and being having zero IQ. If that was the case, then we'd believe it. Then we believe it. What this see, what this season did was take everything that was fantastical, kept it fantastical, but it also took everything that was believable and made it ridiculous beyond belief. And that was my one of the, my major gripes with it. There's others that, we've, that I touched on in my uh, opening uh, rant, but this, is, th- this was one of the particular missteps which, which was uh, egregious. I, I, I don't think I would consider that a rant, Chris. I'm a, you, you can do better. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, move, moving on. So what did you guys? Uh, let's talk about the character work and the growth of the uh, th- that took place over the course of the season. Uh, Chris, uh, the group is much older now from when we last left them in season two. Uh, did you find? I think we touched on it a little bit, but you want to get more specific about how it played into the narrative of the season? Like Lupe mentioned, how uh, Eleven was finally you know being part of the of of our world in in some way. Yeah, I'll, I'll focus on the boys. Um, I thought they were all the main three, uh, four boys from the original series. I thought seeing them growing, uh, grown up and seeing the two of them have girlfriends, the one of them, uh, <laughs> as far as we are concerned as viewers, thinking, oh, it's that, you know, the nerd who claims he's got a girlfriend that he met at summer and, you know, nobody believes them. And, you know, the classic, the, the classic fake story, which I'm sure you used uh, many a summer, Manu. Um, summer, fall, and, winter. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I like that. I really like that. And also the, the one that, you know, seemingly is holding on to the past, onto his past relationships with his with his with his buddies. So I really liked how, you know, some of the boys were moving on. Some of them got completely engrossed with their um relationship with their girlfriend. The other one who was, you know, had a, a seemingly healthy relationship with his girlfriend, balanced, not over the top. But the boys were done really well and very reflective of the kind of the scope of uh, what we might see in adolescent teenage uh, teenage boys. So I thought that was done handled, handled really well. Awesome. That's that's really well said. Uh, Lupe, what about the adults in the series? Uh, were you satisfied with the role that they played uh, and the arcs that played out? Um, now, one of the, the reasons why I have a more negative 
perspective towards the nostalgia-driven um, aspects of the show it is because it relies on 80s tropes. It's not just telling a, a, a story that's set in the 80s. It's relying on 80s tropes. And one of the 80s tropes is kids being adults and adults being kids. And it's annoying to me because it doesn't make any sense. That's exactly what happens. That's exactly what happens in this series. Like, but it's even more egregious in this one. In this one, it seemed like the adults were absolutely useless. They were like they were, get, they were getting in the way of everything. <laughs> even even the bad guy adults were getting you know outsmarted and outwitted you know by kids and it was just like it was just a mess like the adult relationships were juvenile regressed the level of intelligence of adults in the series period regressed um i was wondering why like for an entire like the entire duration of the series no army came to the town <laughs> no cops came to the town until the end, when they said, "Oh, they were they were short. just another example of adult incompetence and stupidity." And they knew what to, happened in this to, town to a, a massive like state of emergency. Like so, in terms of like how adults like played out in this one, it was frustrating because I'm an adult. I like being an adult. I don't dream of being a child anymore. So I personally was not charmed or thrilled by by this one although you know I'm, I'm i'm an 80s baby i was born in the 80s although i can't remember my 80s childhood but um i don't really have a longing to go back to being a child in the 80s so it didn't work on me and i was just bleh. Mm. i'm sorry I, I don't like talking too negatively about things but okay. it's just how i feel well, i'm sorry why don't we uh, switch gears and talk about uh the upside down or the inside out or whatever the hell we're gonna call it <laughs> 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 so is is this a world that you guys want to completely continue to explore or are you are you prepared to move on from it? Uh Chris, why don't you go I was wait I was waiting to explore it. We didn't explore we it. We didn't. We 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 basically the only thing we got was oh the the bad mind flare or whatever it is is in the is still in the upside down, but because oh, the portal's open, we got can, a new monster. He, he can send his messages into the modern, into the real world and create goop monsters out of yeah, people's this congealed was like, skin and bones and This flesh. was like a completely new monster out of nowhere. A completely new, you know, like the, the first, so the first series had the... The, 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 the Demogorgon. The Demogorgon, right? Then we found out that, all right, in the second one, it was, that that, it was the, the big, that was the big, you know, sort of thing. And then this one is like a goop monster. And it's like... <laughs> what is going on? Like, can they can't even keep their story straight? They can't even like develop like the lore. And so it's like when you're going down one path and you're getting excited, and you have this anticipation for what's going to be happening, you get you know diverted, you know, to another path. And then you're like, okay, and then you're diverted again. And here's and the thing, right? So they, they, they were more concerned about showing us. A mall in the eighties than they were of showing us the upside, upside down. down. Yeah, why? That's, that's a very good point. That's, yeah, that's, that's a really good point. Yeah, and and that's the indication here of what the um, the focus and the intention of the of the creators was. It, they they used the eighties as a crutch in this se in this season in a way I di I didn't feel like Lupe will disagree but I didn't feel it was an overt crutch in in season one in season three it felt like everything Lupe describes uh, I I agree with Chris on this like I don't think that it was as as overbearing in the previous seasons as it was here well uh, before we move on uh, to Game of Thrones. Um, so uh, the season uh, largely takes place over July 4th weekend. Uh, uh, Netflix uh, uh, took advantage of this and dropped the series uh, basically on that weekend. So do you think that the ability to line up content release with specific dates is an advantage, is, is an advantage that more streaming sites should consider? And maybe uh, other, uh, other formats, is, and is it something that other formats can't do as well? 
I, I, I have something, something uh, poignant to say about this. All right. So with Netflix's uh, binge watching model, um, you get what you get is two things. You get a, a lot of instantaneous hype. Sometimes it can be like overwhelming, like they really crush it. And then there's like silence until like the next, you know, the next year. So what Netflix for their business, what they they tend to have to do is every couple of weeks have a series that gives them that sort of boost in terms of being in the conversation, being in the zeitgeist, in terms of a particular series. If you're going to go on a week by week basis you're going to need to do something spectacular every single week or else, or at least every couple of weeks before you lose the audience, because you do have the possibility of losing uh, the audience. And this is what happens to like a lot of series, a lot of series that are actually quite good, aren't able to maintain an audience because after because they don't have you know, the chance to build up their story or reveal their secrets or they're taking some experiments or whatever, and they never you know, really get that chance. So with, with Stranger Things, the Duffer Brothers have called them Stranger Things 1, Stranger Things 2, Stranger Things 3. Not Stranger Things Season 1, Stranger Things Season 2 and Season 3. So the way it's written is the whole thing is written like a long, like a long movie. Um, and I think that for the format, for their own storytelling, I think that dropping it in a whole bingeable um, season sort of works for what they do. But at the same time, it's a chicken and egg mm. debate because, because Netflix does it that way. Creators take advantage of that and structure their stories that way. So they don't have like cliffhangers and they don't make like episodes, you know, to, to have that you know, sort of episodic feel to them. It's just supposed to flow continually. Um, so I think it, it's an, it should be on a case-by-case basis because I do think that Netflix does need some series that are, you know, week by week, especially sitcoms. Like, they don't have the sitcoms, like all those Friends and The Office, and those things are made to be, you know, standalone weekly episodes. And for their own model, just talking in general, they need some of that. It just it depends on on the series. And for Stranger Things, I think a whole bingeable, um, a whole bingeable series or a whole bingeable season works better for it. Okay, uh, Chris, you have anything to add? But 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 I don't want to see anymore. <laughs> I think it's just wrap it up. Just, just put a bow on I'm, it. I'm done. Honest, I, when when season one first came out, I actually thought it was good. It was a standalone, and that was it. If you remember, like everybody wasn't really sure if there was going to be like another um, season, but then they were like, "Oh yeah, it's no, it's, this is not just like a standalone thing. It's something that we're going to." And I honestly feel like after season one, they should have just wrapped it up because now it seems like they're just milking. It. Right. Yeah, uh, Chris, what about you? Uh, well, there's there's two things I I, I want to uh, touch on. The first being, um, I'm curious as to whether we will start seeing a kind of a war between streaming services for particular dates like we do kind of cinematically so um you'll get one movie being dropped so you might see star wars being dropped at christmas time and then every other blockbuster that was Every other studio that was thinking about right putting, a, yeah, was thinking about <laughs> putting a, a blockbuster in that period, they, they will move away. Um, so, if we're going to get talk about July Fourth and these prestige um, kind of dates, like Halloween, like Halloween, July. Christmas, mm-hmm. New Year, you know, middle of summer. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see if if anything like that would transpire in the future. Uh, with regards to Stranger Things, um, whether what they should do here on out, what I'd really like to see them do, I don't want them to end it because I did love season one uh, as much as I did, and I did enjoy season two. What I'd like them to do is do what um, do what True Detective did, 
I want them to go away. I want them to go away. I want them to go write a good story. Don't feel pressured by the age of the kids because, you know, they're going to grow up anyway, whether you do, uh, whether you just film something immediately or not. And, and I think that's what it was. I think they were, they were scared about the kids growing up too much. They hashed out this half-baked story used um, <laughs> this is a crutch. Uh, whereas, and, and they didn't really have the things that were important, which was good storytelling. So what I'd like them to do... Well, how would they, how would they lean on the crutch of kids if, well, they, if they, they wait for the kids well, to Well, if they wait, the, the kids are still... The kids are still relatively young. They, they can go away for two years instead of one year. I think this... Really this wasn't this past what, two years? Wasn't it a two-year gap from the two... It was, a, it, was a, it was a one and a half year okay. gap. Um, but I would like them to, to take a whole two-year gap and spend one year really hashing out a good story. Tell tell us something new about the Upside Down. Don't focus on the mall. Don't focus on Hawkins in the 80s or the 90s, as it might be. Just tell us something about the Upside Down so you don't have to use the, um, the time period as a crutch. Find a story to tell, tell a story, and then come back, whether it's in two or three years' time, and tell a good story and I'll be there for it. I just don't want what we got because it was, it was, there was no storytelling to it. There was no, there was no real story. There was no real character progression or development. It's just like, honestly, like what, like what's going on? Like, okay, who, what do we know more about the, the inside out? <laughs> what do we know more about what happened to to 11 and bringing people to to account and if anyone else could could ha- 11 re-establish a relationship with her mother yeah uh, could- like like there there's there's so much more to do than just oh another oh a monster comes out and we have to defeat yeah. the monster it, it all felt just- very rushed so that's what i want to see I, I don't want it cancelled i want them to Fix take it. as much time as they need to get a to tell a story worth telling and come if they have to come back in two three years time and the kids are a bit older fine but give us a story give us a good story well i think that our listeners really do feel like they're in the upside down right now because i think we uh we went pretty hard at stranger things three which i'm sure they were not expecting and i'm sure they're gonna be expecting even less us seeing good stuff about the last season of game of thrones so (laughs) Uh, let's keep it moving all right um well stranger things is still available to everybody out on netflix uh so let's talk about game of thrones um (laughs) okay so uh how do you guys feel about the final season and do you guys think that it was a fitting end to this gigantic series uh lupe get us started all right so i'm gonna i guess save the worst for first or (laughs) because this is a very no, it's, this is a controversial, a controversial response. Most people have been reveling in bashing, you know, this season and and just, you know, slandering, you know, um, the the creators and everybody has just been, you know, been on a mob lynch tip. Um, I think it was excellent. I really loved it. I have no issues with it. You would say it was rushed. I don't feel it was rushed. Could it have been longer? Yes. But one of my, my my criticisms of the series in earlier seasons was that it was it was too laborious and too long-winded. A lot of times they'd spend like five episodes with some characters trekking through the countryside, chatting shit to each other, and I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like you know, <laughs> so in this in this season, I felt like they they just got more to the point. They just spend time with like, okay, Daenerys is going from uh, Winterfell to uh, you know to the the Dragonstone, or yeah, whatever. or whatever. So let's spend you know three episodes, three episodes on a boat, with her, <laughs> in, on a boat with her chatting shit and trading banter with Tyrion Lannister. Like that's the old Game of Thrones. 
I mean, that was okay. I'm not, you know, really ragging on those episodes for that because it was developing characters and letting us know who they were, where they were from. But now we know who they are. We don't need all that. We can get straight to events and what's actually happening. So I had no problem with the pace. In I'll terms also of add that there's less pieces on the chessboard. Like, yeah, I think before the, the show could take time going all over Westeros and spending mm-hmm. time here and then we'll go to Winterfell and we'll go to like, but that's not the case anymore when we get to this final yeah. season. There's there's yeah. far less people, there's far less places to go. Everybody is much closer to each other than they ever were before. So naturally, uh, the pace of the show is going to ratchet up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also I felt in terms of spectacle, the spectacle like was, I mean, a lot more impressive than other seasons and i feel like for the crescendo for the third act so to speak for the you know um penultimate you know um season all that stuff it was it was it was just right cinematography by fabian wagner the compositions um that they came up with were absolutely incredible um the long nights which was that uh the 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 battle you know um at winterfell this season was incredibly shot i think it was well executed the stuff with the dragons the vfx and i like the way it ended one thing is i've been watching game of thrones since it began i'm not one of the people who hopped on midway through when they heard it was a spectacular show and i was watching it when i was when you know we were getting endings to characters arcs that we didn't like like that was one of the first lessons you learned watching game of thrones shit is not going to go the way you expect it to you're not owed anything like don't come in here and say no it's not supposed to this is not supposed to happen to this character this is that's not the way it works in this world you know good guys if if ned stark's dev didn't tell you that then exactly like the red wedding didn't tell you that then i don't know why you're expecting like a happy ending and expected ending oh they built this character this character has done all this stuff in the past so they should do this stuff now you're not old shit you know and i think that the rationale for the way that it ended was actually like really good i i also think controversially i think that a lot of people saw daenerys as a sort of um a feminist icon you know, she was like a female, you know, powerful dragon rider, a queen, someone who was avenging, you know, going through the fire, literally being, you know, raped, um, all that kind of stuff. So they just expected that she'll go on this crusade and she'll sit on the throne and, you know, but if you've been watching the show, sorry to get too deep into it, especially in the beginning now, it's but funny. if you've been if you've been watching the show, you'd re- you'd you'd realize that she was about as much a tyrant as everyone else. She had blood on her hands. She was just it was just that she was the hero of her own story. To so some other, I mean, she locked people in, starved people to death. Her dragons burned people. There were people, you know. She said, "You either join me, or I'm going to kill you." Know you, and she did so, like. It's interesting, and it really gives us an interesting look at us as a society and how we allow our heroes or people who align with us, either politically or the way we look, or there's just something sympathetic about them. We allow them to get away with murder and get away with doing evil things. It's like the same conversation we have about Batman. Batman does a lot of reprehensible stuff, but because he's our hero, we like the way he's portrayed, to let him get away with a lot of bad things but if you really look at it like the dude is not really a good person and same thing with Daenerys sorry to break it to you people who are big fans of hers or wanted <laughs> her to you know be the hero of everything she did a lot of really 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 bad stuff maybe some people did worse, worse stuff but she wasn't like perfect and Jon Snow saw that and her descent into complete madness it wasn't really a far it wasn't far-fetched at all. She was already on the brink. She was already on the brink of 
being yeah, a bad I, person. I, I agree. Uh, Chris, why don't you chime in? What do, what, do, what do you think about what Lupe said and, and the series as a whole? Uh, I mean, the well, season as a whole before you. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll talk briefly about the whole show that I, I, I like Lupe. I started it from the get-go. Um, I started it on episode one uh season one so it's been a it's been a long journey for me and Mm -hmm. what i'll say is throughout the so it's a political drama really this this is this whole thing is a political drama Mm -hmm. so one of the things that i picked up on is um what you were saying lupe about the pace in the final season uh and people might be uh complaining about how things were happening fast or whatever but in politics in life what you'll see is it does take a long time to put the pieces and set the wheels in motion and And eventually eventually what's going to happen is stuff's going to happen and it happens very fast and it all happens very fast if you're you're, you're familiar with history like the way world wars break out and stuff like that it'll take years to set up and then all of a sudden, everybody just like, oh my goodness, this stuff happened so quickly and we weren't able to stop it. Right. So so that reflects what you would normally expect. So there's no complaints from me there. I don't want to see two episodes of uh, Daenerys cracking jokes with uh, Tyrion or seeing a burgeoning uh, love affair with Jon Snow. You know, we know these characters. We know what makes them tick. So I didn't need that from season eight. What I needed from what what I needed from season eight was to was basically what I got. I was very happy with how season eight ended. I'm not gonna lie. I live in so Westeros is all based basically on Britain. The north is basically north of England. The the beyond the wall is basically Scotland beyond Hadrian's Wall. Uh, Winterfell, uh, Winterfell could be seen as any northern English city. Um, the the capital, uh, King's Landing, is basically right. London. Uh, beyond the sea is like uh, your north, northern Africa, Europe or, or northern Europe. Africa or whatever. So, as a North Englishman, I was very happy to see the Starks. <laughs> I was very happy to see the Starks come out on top. Um, <laughs> From the beginning, and and what I'll tell you is from the beginning, uh, I was Team Jon Snow from the beginning. So, if anyone should be upset that he's not sitting on the that he's not sitting on the Iron uh, Throne, it's me. And if you ask me, he deserves to sit on the Iron Throne because he is the true uh, the true heir, and he is the right character. But how it transpired very creative, the history keeper of men and what what is powerful is telling stories. I love all of those themes. And yeah, absolutely no problem with how how it ended and who sat on the Iron Throne. To cheapen eight years of storytelling to satisfy uh, some uh, modern day agenda, which is modern day, it wasn't like uh, these narratives did not exist uh, or were not prominent when the show began. They will not be prominent in 10 years. Everything is a cycle in life. And it just so happens that in 2019 and 2018, 2019, we have this agenda uh, driven by media and social media. So... Why should creatives um, sacrifice eight years of hard work to satisfy something which is fleeting and passing? I don't, I don't see why they should. So I'm glad they ended the show in the way they did. And if anyone doesn't like it, they can cry about it. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree with a lot of what you two have said. And I'll add that in a season where we got both The Long Night and uh, I forgot the name of the episode, The... Uh, the, the, before the bells the, yeah the bells i mean and you're watching some of the most exhilarating beautifully shot most like the the amount of time that they must have spent conceptualizing those episodes 
and and still find a way to complain about that is beyond me. I I, I really think that that uh, Game of Thrones pushed the, the, the television format to a point that had never been done to that point. And I understand that some people are not happy that their favorite characters didn't end up the way that they had imagined them they would for like three or four years. But if you look at it from a storytelling standpoint, when you look at it as a as a body of work, I don't think that you can hold much against what uh, these creators chose to do. I think that this season is strong, and I think that it upholds all of the things that Game of Thrones has been about from the very beginning. And and it's and it's crazy to say that in this day and age, I really think that they should be applauded for that because it would have been so easy for them to just to just you know please everybody. But they they stay true to how they saw this story ending out, and I and again I think that Bronn being king is is resonant because I've said this before. This series began with him. Uh, not like all of these events transpired when Jamie pushed him off the top of the of the pushed him off the top of the tower. And uh, I just feel like there's this beautiful symmetry that takes place. How this series ends with him being crowned as king. I I, I will agree with that completely. I think those who watched from the beginning and really digested season one will appreciate the ending more than those yeah. who jumped in halfway. So how I watched the the series was um, I watched all of season one as it came out, and then prior to season two coming out, I binged season one and then watched season two week by week. Mm -hmm. And then when season three came out, I binged season one, two, three, and then watched three by, week by week. Yeah, and I, I did, did that. Mm -hmm. I did that until season five. So I prior to season five, I binged the four series, uh, the four seasons, mm -hmm. and then watched season five. Beyond that, it was too much mm -hmm. i couldn't have done it now mm -hmm. but what i'll say is yeah i think i think that because i've seen season one so many times and i digested it and really enjoyed it i think that that is why i appreciated the final season and the symmetry in the final season that you brought up manu i i appreciated that so so much and, and i think others who did watch it from the beginning or or even season one and you know, started in season two, for example, will appreciate will have appreciated it more than people who just jumped in season six, watched six seasons like that, and then had to wait three years for you know their story to be told. But I think I think it rewards the week by week uh, watching experience. Mm -hmm. Also, it's interesting and ironic that in in a world that is known for you know being dark and for, you know, the rain falling on the just and the unjust alike, oh. there was a profound sense of moral balance and justice at the end. I think a lot of people look at sitting on the throne as this ultimate goal and as this sort of ultimate boon, but at the end of the day, that throne had caused so much pain, so much death, so much destruction. And it was almost as if Bran, someone who has no desire for power, no desire to rule people, no desire for wealth, no desire for status or position, to sit on the throne is almost like breaking that cycle. And that is a mature way of looking at it. And the legacy of all these characters, of Jon Snow, of the Starks, of the, the people of the Vale, if you, if, you, if you think of it in a mature way, it shouldn't be about who sits on the throne. It should be about what they did with their lives, their exploits. If they stood up for justice, if they stood up for, for, for people, it's not about sitting on the throne. And that's what led... That's what led. Um, that's what led Daenerys astray. She was, she was obsessed with her birthright, with sitting on the throne, and she lost sight of the fact that more important than sitting on the throne is 
freeing people, being just, being good, being kind, and you know, and in the end, also, we're just doing what's killing everybody that stood in her way and amassing allies and having people kneel before her. And it's just, it's a very immature way of, of looking at it. When you think of, oh, it was Brand that ended up sitting on the throne. Oh, I'm disappointed. It should have been Jon Snow. Why? Jon Snow had a happy ending. And the he did. Best thing he did. About he had it, a wonderful and the, ending. And the best thing about it was that nobody sat on the Iron Throne because the Iron Throne was melted. So yeah. we didn't even get that image of a particular person sitting on the Iron Throne. And I think that is so poetic. Yeah. Well, so you, poetic. You know what I find even more poetic is that people were upset at the show for doing all of the things for why it was successful in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if like if you if you like like Chris said, if you watch the show from the beginning, it never followed the stories and the expectations of audiences it's and the desires. All of it. It it it, it the, the entire show is about always. Uh, always not get never getting what it is that you want, you know. Even like even things like Arya going off to study off to be a warrior. She she she, she didn't even finish that training because you know, like it, it's things like the show had the show constantly usurped expectations, and when it did it again this time at the end, I feel like uh, that the fact that people were so upset about it, I think that says a lot more about the people watching the show than it does the showrunners themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, 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 it was a bit of a victim of its own success. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's, let's, it's, let's, let's talk about, things. let's, let's talk briefly about, about the show's success. Like, I don't think that there's been many shows that have held uh, the attention and the discussion and the debate that Game of Thrones has over the last eight, nine years or so. Uh, what, what do you think that is? Uh, Chris, what, what was it about Game of Thrones that, that sucked you in to this point? So, I'll I'll give you a little anecdote. Um, I my a, a friend of my cousin's is um, one of the actors on on the show, and she told me um, prior to even knowing about Game of Thrones, I actually introduced her to Game of Thrones um, in season two or three, I think that. Um, so I, I introduced her to the show and one day we're watching it and she's like, oh my God, that's, and she, she, she was shocked by who was in it and that's one of her friends. Um, and then after the episode, well, we had, I can't remember if it was after the episode or we paused it during the episode, she was telling me about meeting this actor you know, just for a pint of beer in, in the local pub one day and him telling uh, him telling her, um, I've got something big coming up. Mm-hmm. I can't say what it is, but it's it's big. And so I think the expectation was big before. Um, before it even before, aired? Be, before it even aired, because we're talking about a really important um, set of novels here. Um, these novels are read by thousands, if not millions, of people around the world. So anyone with any knowledge of these novels is going to generally have this kind of level of excitement. Um, it's a very powerful series. Um, so, yeah, I, I think really they were onto a winner from the get-go. Sometimes you, you have to be lucky, uh, like HBO had to take a punt on it like you know there's hundreds of great books thousands of great books even um it's they pick the right one to to kick off their you know to to use on their platform and you know i think they 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 made a brilliant (laughs) brilliant choice obviously um why people got sucked into it at a later date is another question um it's like anything really if if Something is popular. You see it in sports. You see it in everyday life. If a team is doing well, uh, if a football team is doing well, then everyone's going to support. You know, people who are neutral or not invested in that sport to begin with, who are you going to join? The the team that's winning. 
uh, what show are you going to watch? Uh, the show that everyone's talking about. Um, what film franchise are you going to follow? The one that everyone's... Fo- so there is a bit of a herd mentality of, about it, and that would explain some of the um, the complaints. But I think the true... Um, you know, the true fans, I don't like to say true fans, but the, the people who were interested in it uh, in the beginning kind of realised that this wasn't just uh, any old, this wasn't going to be just any old series. It was always going to be something big because because the novels are. Uh, Lupe, your turn. Why, why don't you tell us? Um, so we, we've given through the three Game of Thrones from the very, very beginning, but I think like many of the people who started it, you, you had two types of people. One, fans of the of the uh, of the books, which there there are many. The books have sold like millions and millions, so there must be millions. And um, fans of prestige television. Yeah. Now, when you're a fan of prestige uh, film or television, you're used to mature storytelling. Yeah. And so, when you're you're getting you know sort of slow dialogue, intense um, scenes, um, endings that uh, are are endings to character arcs that are atypical. Um, You're not put off or you're not disappointed or, you know, you, you give things more of a chance. You're more intellectual with your sort of uh, consumption of the material. Um, So those are the things that kept the series for the first maybe three, four seasons. And it grew slowly as more people convinced people to, to, to watch it. Also, there was nothing on TV like it. It was also at a time when there were there weren't a lot of prestige options and binge worthy options, so um, so it didn't have a lot of competition. Although to be sincere, it's better than a lot of stuff that that's been out there. So I, I believe it would compete favorably in any in any um, environment. But all these factors, you know, gave it you know good viewership. And then the red wedding happened. <laughs> the red wedding absolutely blew the doors off the 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 series because even for someone like like myself, who's used to this sort of storytelling, that was, I mean, one of the fun things was it was always you know even from the, the first couple of episodes when they start died, I was like, wait, wasn't this about Ned Stark? And then, you know, um, it, that continued, continually happened. You'd get invested into one character and, and the character would just be killed off. So those were fun things people were always talking about on social media that had people sort of like curious. But the Red Wedding was a massive one. Um, and I think that's when it brought on a lot of, um, of, of new viewers and that's when its popularity really exploded. And it's interesting because once its popularity exploded, obviously they had more money to spend. So then, you know, the dragons became a bigger part. They were the only ones, you know, really doing like dragons on on TV. So that was like a selling point, special effects, bigger set pieces, battles. So those spectacle things were able to keep popular audiences on board. But I think that um, once the the conclusion of it took on a more a more uh, took on an ending that's more familiar to people who have been watching the the series from the beginning, something unexpected. Although it being you know quote unquote it, it being sh- a shorter season <clears throat> in terms of episodes is not what it was at the beginning. Um, by that time the popularity was like really big and the sort of people who are watching it are in my opinion, not the people who are used to this type of storytelling to bring up like a lot of controversial films, things like, for example, like if anyone out there has watched Batman v Superman and Watchmen, it's that sort of storytelling that 
just requires, in my mind, a mature mature audience, a mature viewer, someone who, you know, is not really, doesn't feel entitled. Well, so, sorry, you know? to, sorry to cut you off, but I think that that's a, a really great point that you're making, that that it basically what the show did in its final seasons is return back to to its roots. It's to go back to what made it for what what made it so special for those of us that have been there from the very beginning. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And another thing I'll add is while it while we have uh, we've discussed how it's really a, a political drama, you can't get away from the um how can I say it? the fantastical element of the world? So it, it's a world that is not, you know, it's not very close to, but it does resemble in some ways the world of, uh, of Lord of the Rings. And and what we what we got um, what we got in the early two thousands was th- was a trilogy by Peter Jackson, which really opened people's minds, I feel, to the possibilities of seeing this kind of kind of medieval, kind of fantastical, um, imaginary world. Um, and that was, and and I think it came out at the same time, uh, I think the, the series started in 2011, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the um, and that was around the time that we, we were getting the Hobbit series as well. I think the, the Hobbit trilogy was 2012 to 2014. So there was clearly, clearly um, a thirst and a desire for more of this kind of um, high fantasy, high fantasy uh, kind of storytelling and and world um, world that we got in in Game of Thrones. And I think maybe that's why um, anticipation or, or excitement was was high from from the beginning. Okay, uh, so I, I think we're all going to agree on this last point. Uh, you, we all agree that HBO did the right thing by keeping the show episode uh, like a weekly episode release instead of going. Yeah. We all agree on that, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I kind of feel sorry for people that that binged it. Well, no, I binged it. Oh, I, oh, no, 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 I mean no, the yeah. first time. Yeah, yeah, no, time. no, 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 no. But to, to be to be sincere, I, okay. So I I haven't told you guys how I watched it. The first about three seasons. Yeah. I used to watch it week by week. Yeah. But then remember how I say it, it could be a little bit laborious. It could take a long time. Yeah. So imagine like, like for me, not enough was happening quickly. And <laughs> I'll spend like, I don't know, for me, I, I'd spend the week just anticipating the next episode and just, you know. That's so, how it used to be. Yeah. So what I ended up doing was I'd wait until the, the season's over. Mm. Avoid spoilers. I'm 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 lucky that the people that I follow on social media are very unselfish. They're very you know uh, they're very um, intelligent. They're film savvy. They know not to post spoilers, and they post spoilers as a big warning so you can avoid it. So then, once the season finishes or just right before the final season, the I final watch episode I, the, the final season. episode. So I started doing that about maybe season four. So mm. maybe four, mm. five, six. Seven I, and eight. I did. I did that. So, and in terms of binging, I, I think personally, I prefer it. But definitely for the growth of the show, yeah, and for the conversation, the prolonged conversation, definitely was. It's better for them to 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 How make they it, did it weekly. Yes, weekly definitely. I agree with you. Man. Yeah. I uh, watch I'll, every single season week to week. Every single season I watch it week to week. Yeah. Every single one of them. Yeah, I, 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 like I said, I kind of feel sorry that for people who 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 binged it, not because okay, Lupe's got per- personal preference, but I think by binging shows, you you miss out on 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 something. Um, I think you lose the ability to digest the minutia of every single episode. Um, there's going to be things that so you can watch. You can watch it week to week, but like I, I might watch an episode twice during that week or three times. Like you would watch one of your favorite films yeah. multiple times yeah. and know every single detail about it. Like I think I, I, think I watched The Long Night like six times. The yeah, week that when, it was when you released. binge something, the the chances of doing that and revisiting episodes, or you don't even have to revisit every episode. There might be one particular episode, like you said, the the the, the long. Yeah. 
The Long Night. The Long Night. Battle of the Bastards. Yeah, or the Battle of the Bastards. Oh. You could you can watch Ooh. it. Battle of the Bastards. That's a really great one. Without without jumping onto the next episode, I think it, it would take a lot of restraint to do that. Whereas if you're watching it week to week, there's the conversation. You know, uh, I remember when I used to when I used to go to school and I used to watch. Um, trying to think one of the shows I used to watch when I go to school, but when we'd come back the from the weekend, it would, the whole week would be talking about that one episode, and then you get in the real nitty-gritty. One of your friends might pick up something on that one episode that, that you missed out on, and then you remember because you were, you know, you, you were reminded of it. And I think that's one of the beauties of uh, watching a film uh, week to week, but I I also accept that there's advantages to to um, to dropping shows like Netflix does in in one go. Um, it's I think on something as special as Game of Thrones, I think you are very well served watching it week to week, especially the earlier seasons because that's where everything gets laid down. I agree. I agree. I, um, I, I have. A- I mean, after after you 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 give us uh, your thoughts, um, I have a question for both of you. So obviously, every single platform is looking for the next Game of Thrones. All right, Netflix they have The Witcher coming up, and I've heard in interviews and in articles reference it reference it reference to even the cast and the crowds. Oh, could this be the next Game of Thrones? Amazon. Bought Lord of the Rings from HBO and Warner Brothers for a pretty penny. Also, HBO have their own next Game of Thrones, which is a Game of the Thrones prequel. Um, and uh, th- there, there are a bunch of other sort of obscure ones that uh, that platforms are working on. But after you, um, after you, you, you address, I'd like us to talk about, you know, what we think. The success rate or the phenomenon or whatever is going to be. Uh, I don't think that anything's going to match this. I, I really don't. I think that Game of Thrones had so many things working for it. Uh, from not only from the fact that the the, the series was already successful before it became a show, uh, but also the writing of this show in particular, especially in the early seasons, was always one of the strongest aspects. Uh, and then. Uh, the actors and uh, the directors that they found, the cinematographers, the crew that they had. Like, for me, it just felt like this was a crew and a production that knew how to do really great things very quickly and uh, and for much cheaper than uh, than I feel like a lot of other people will are, are aiming for. I, I don't think that will be that any of these other shows that are coming up will be able to measure up to what Game of Thrones was able to give us year after year. Yeah, I, I personally, you know me, I, I'm not a big fan of spin-offs, universes. Uh, you know, I'm, I don't like emulation. I... I would I would personally stray away from anything that claimed to be Game of Thrones like because when someone says Game of Thrones like for me that what they're really saying is Game of Thrones light I am not interested in an imitation I am interested in original storytelling mm-hmm. if something were to come up in the future that was indeed like Game of Thrones, but it was its own thing and not trying to be the new Game of Thrones. Sure, by all means. But this incessant and this modern kind of obsession with trying to be like something else, and we see it with uh, with film franchises, that what's going to be the new Marvel? Now we see something original like the DC films, trying to emulate the MCU. We see, um, you know, see, uh, we see hundreds and hundreds of sequels from, we're at Fast and Furious 73 now, and it's just, it's, it's too much. I want to see original storytelling, so anything that tried to be their next Game of Thrones wouldn't interest me. All right, Lupe, what about you, man? 
Um, I, th I think it's, it's, it's complex. My crystal ball is, is a little uh, foggy at the moment. So I can't, <laughs> I can't give you guys a definitive answer like I usually do. Um, for HBO's Game of Thrones prequel, I, I'm disappointed in, in, in prequel. I don't like prequels because I always have this sort of lingering thought in my mind, like I know where it's going to end. So that knocks a lot of the suspense out of the out of out of the equation for me. I like the Hobbit. That was one of the things that watching the Hobbit movies that always struck me. Like I always knew where everything was going to end like where the character was going to end and then the Lord of the Rings would start. Like, it's like, for me personally, it takes elements of mystery out of, I, it, of the original as well, the right? Original, yeah. It, so you might not know the, the, the backstory of the Night King, but do you need to know? Yeah. Isn't yeah. part of the mystique, isn't, isn't the mystique of the Night, uh, the Night King, King part, part of its of. attraction? So... I don't know where the I've not read much about the prequel or whatever, but I'm just picking that as yeah. an example of, yeah. of why prequels or how prequels can it be pre dangerous. Prequels, prequels I don't like. Like for me, if they had said they were going thousands of years in the future, I would have preferred that. Mm. If I, 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 I do not know what George Miller, I said George Miller, what, um, our, what Martin, what Martin um, envisioned, but if they were going to do, I would have preferred for them to have done something in the future. Now, the problem is that they sold Lord of the Rings to Amazon. The smart thing to have done would be go from Game of Thrones to do Lord of the Rings for the next 10 years, then bring Game of Thrones back for 10 years and, and continue you know, to tell new stories, not do prequels, because also the Lord of the Rings is also going to be a prequel. <laughs> the Amazon's Lord of the Rings series is actually going to be a prequel as well. It's going to be a prequel to like Lord of the Rings, and so and then The Witcher. I think where The Witcher, I've seen a lot of the pre-production stuff and and behind the scenes stuff for The Witcher, and they are trying to dive into what Game of Thrones became, right from the jump, which I guess may have to do with the world that they live in. But Game of Thrones built up very slowly. Like, I remember, like, in the beginning seasons, I was wondering, like, wow, there's not, like, a lot of magic and a lot of creatures and a lot of... Like, that was stuff that they really built up to, partially because they didn't have the finances for it. And obviously, the story... And if you look at a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff, they got so lucky because the cast and crew learned all these things for years and years and years. So by the time season eight came up, they were masters. They had been doing small skill stuff and building and building. And series like The Witcher are just diving right into it and like, oh, it's gonna be action packed and there's gonna be sweeping, you know, landscapes and castles and big battles. And and I think that that lack of a buildup is just not is not going to serve them very well. Also, one thing that people underestimate with Game of Thrones is that Game of Thrones hired a lot of British actors. And dude, like as an American, I'm just telling you, like British actors are good. And this was at a time when like these guys were not famous, so they could get them for cheap. They were not famous. Weren't doing anything in Hollywood, so they could get them for cheap. So it was like. They found this incredible economic model that worked. But The Witcher, someone like The Witcher that's trying to imitate Game of Thrones, is not hiring the same level of actors. Even Henry Cavill, as much like Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill, though he comes from that background, Henry Cavill is not a thespian like that. He's more, he, Henry Cavill fits more into the American model of an actor than your classic British actor does. I, and so this. I agree with you, and I'll go back to my original point that it, it wasn't just the people in front of the camera, but the entire crew that was behind it. Like, they went out of their way to hire 
like some of the best in the industry to be able to do what they were able to do. And like you said, it grew over time. They kept adding to to their book. They kept adding uh, people that could come in and give them more of what they needed as the show grew. And that's very different than when you're trying to start off from it right off the go. And again, I do think that is because these new series are competing with what Game of Thrones ended up being and not what it started being. Okay. All right. Completely agree, man. I completely agree. Okay. Well, I think that uh, we should end it here. I think we had a really good uh, discussion about these two shows. And uh, thank you both for uh, for um, chiming in. Uh, Chris, why don't you give us your at, and we'll, uh, and we'll head out of here. Thank you to Manu. Thank you. So you can all find me, the Toxic Doctor, at Vinaldo7 on Twitter and on Vero. All right. Uh, Lupe, what about you? It's been my pleasure to be a guest. Thank you for hosting. Uh, Manu, you can find me on Twitter at Live Love Lupe. All right, and you can find me at Man United 0710. You can find the film Exiles at the Film Exiles and the network at the Exiles Net. Again, thank you very much for for uh, for coming in and listening to us talk, and uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> See, now that sees me having to play. <laughs> All right, good night.